Welcome to the Queen Trail Podcast. Meditation doesn't have to be sitting still and having an empty mind. The journey is such a beautiful thing because we are all on a journey. You want to make sure you have some kind of distribution plan, or at least have an idea of it, because you can make this really amazing film and it only gets seen by your family and friends. Old Hollywood is still intact. Every horse runs hard, but when they win, and they know it. They've got this little sass about them. It was pretty rough. I had to go into the water and with my med pack, swim to the beach, treat these guys, put them on my back, swim out to the helo. And I'm like, oh my God, I've never seen those before. And I said, what are those? And before I could even finish the sentence, she said, oh my God, you didn't touch them, did you? Even if monarchs go away and we never see one again, because there never will be monarchs again, let's say that out, it is just a little indicator of larger threats my dad said so what were you guys doing in the desert i said we were taking nude photos <laughs> welcome back i hope you had a great week since the last time that we got together i am delighted to bring this week's guest richard foss he is the executive director of collage he's also a culinary historian and a board member of the culinary historians of southern california he is an author And he just has such a magnificent story to share from the eclectic, inclusive, and joyous atmosphere of collage, which really has no creative limits. It's a wonderful space in the harbor, a little 48-seat theater that has the most amazing programs and a really spectacular musical outreach program. You have got to hear what they're doing. We talk about understanding food culture and history, the eclectism of Los Angeles, and so much more. So please grab a cuppa and join Richard Foss and me in this In the Company of Friends talk. Enjoy. How are you? Alive and well, thank you. That's great to hear. We will go ahead and get started. I know you've got a lot ahead of you today with the program tonight. You're the executive director of Collage, which is an eclectic art space that serves up programs that are adventurous yet accessible. And it's a really broad spectrum of programs. There's visual, performative, culinary, literary cultural programs, and many of them offer an educational and an entertainment aspect as well. Well, all of the things that you just said are true, but we're a little more than that because of the fact that the things that we do are not entirely limited to things that happen in our space. We are involved in doing some programs that are off-site when that's the right place for them. For instance, For many years, I've been running culinary programs for the culinary historians of Los Angeles and for a group that I started called The Thoughtful Feast, in which we go to restaurants and I work with a restaurateur and say, all right, there's a menu that I've never seen because I'm this generic white guy from California and it's behind the counter and it's the one that your ethnic community, cultural community has for when they come in for a wedding. It's the kind of thing that you make for a family dinner. So we do some events that are offsite where we set things up, set up a dinner, and then have it at their restaurant. So we're surrounded in their environment. And we are open to the possibility and exploring the possibility of doing some other types of programs in spaces other than our own space. Now, Collage did start out as an art space that was primarily about music, but there has always been the intention of broadening that out to poetry, to authors doing readings and talking about their books, to all kinds of different things. And while we are a resource for San Pedro in that we're serving the local community, We have people who come to our programs from all over greater Los Angeles because of the fact that we're offering some things that, well, if you want to find it, we're the only people who are doing it. So we're hoping to cross-pollinate our programs so that people who show up for a music program, while they're there, they'll find out about a book they might 
want to read and the author is coming or poetry or what are the art programs and workshops. And we've had those both in the forms of events that are lessons and sometimes events where an artist will get up there and explain their work and talk about their motivations and talk about some aspect of their work that people wouldn't otherwise think of. And we do like to have, uh, I think the old word for it was edutainment, where you are being educated and entertained at the same time. I don't regard that as a bad word. I think it's a wonderful word. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's a sad thing that people separated that kind of thing because of the fact that for someone with an active mind to receive an education about some aspect of art and culture is really exciting and fun. And that's a part of what we do. That's part of our rationale. Right. So you're fostering that curiosity within the audience and providing them a a really immersive experience, as well as being able to answer their questions. Is it a lot of it Q&A? Most programs have some element of Q&A, even some of our music programs, we encourage the musicians to hang out afterward and talk about the things that they, that people have just heard and what their inspiration was. And, you know, we like having that conversation. Right? We try to leave a little bit of time after each event for people to just hang out and talk and try to make it a space in which people are comfortable not just being audience. Uh, yes, be audience during the show. Don't talk. Be quiet. But after the show, meet each other and meet the performers. Mm -hmm. And another aspect of what we do is that we're doing several different monthly programs in which we bring in the community to interact with each other in music. Uh, We have some jazz jams that have been going on for more than a year now that have just gotten fantastic, where we've had 16, 18 people show up who bring their instruments and about an equal number who show up to listen and you know, maybe they'll go up and take a song or something similar. And it's just fantastic finding out the local talent in our community. And one of the things that delights me is that it's cross-generational. At a recent one, uh, the oldest person there was a senior citizen who was almost 80. And at the same time, we had a 14-year-old drummer who was <laughs> shockingly good. He, I mean, wow. a 14-year-old drummer who plays with finesse and who, when someone would name an obscure jazz tune, I just turned down the sheet music. Yeah, I know that one. Didn't look at sheet music all evening and just started everything <laughs> off. And it's like, where did this kid come from? And That's amazing. His dad, his dad gave him a ride there and just said, oh, he's been like that since he was a small child. He's been playing drums since he was four or five years old, and he loves this music. Wow. But getting people from the community, from school-age kids to senior citizens, Playing jazz, another week every month, we have our ukulele night, where if you play the ukulele, come on in and do it, uh, or come on in and listen, and you can just play along for people who are relatively new players or not confident. You can sit in the back and play softly and get your chops up, and for people who are really good, there's a period of time where each person can take a song or you know take a tune and show off a little bit. And it means that no matter what level you are at, there's something for you there. We've started something that is really eclectic, which is singing English folk songs. Mm -hmm. Because of the fact that for a lot of people who love to sing, where is your chance in this community or in any broad community around us? Where's your place that you can come and sing secular harmonies? Well, it's right here. We're doing Renaissance songs. We're working our way up toward doing some of the more difficult material like madrigals. But for anybody who just loves to sing, there's something here for you. We're getting started with a bluegrass and Americana jam session. We want to get these to the point where if you're someone who loves playing music and has been looking for people to play music with, you'll see something on our calendar every month that will make you dust off that instrument and come on over. (laughs) That's wonderful. You know, I have a few instruments lying around here. I've never been much of a musician, but when you when you mentioned the ukulele, I love that. I picked it up and there was a period of time where I thought, you know, let's see if I can learn something new. Instead of scrolling, I'm going to spend that amount of time learning how to play the ukulele. And I taught myself how to play Over the Rainbow 
Um, Yay. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty neat. I, I'm not clearly very good at it, but I set it down and I haven't played since. And I think it would be really fun to join one of the jams and be one of the people that sits way in the back, quietly strumming it because there's a lot that goes into playing these instruments. And also just that sense of community of belonging, of being part of something that these events bring. I am a terrible mandolinist and uh, my musical activity in public has mostly been limited to when there has been some Victorian dance session where there are waltzes. It's like, yep, I can play waltzes all day. I know Mm -hmm. that beat and I'm going to be there in the back row peering at the music and playing the notes that are on the paper. But I'm not an inventive musician. I'm like a lot of adult learners. (laughs) Uh, It takes a long time to really get to the point where you're able to join in on some kind of freeform music session. And I'm not there yet. But if I keep on practicing, I'll get there. I'll get a little closer each day. Yeah. And it's nice to have other people who are at the same level as you or a little above you to encourage you to keep it up. And just getting together with other like-minded individuals is just so rewarding in and of itself. So it's really great that you've got these jam sessions. And so far it's for bluegrass and ukulele. Well, Actually, we've already started up with the jazz and the ukulele sessions, and we have the singing sessions. We're just getting the old time and Americana and you know maybe a little bluegrass going. I've just found someone to lead that, and I want to expand to doing that more. I, we're talking about having a second jazz session per month because our current sessions are on Wednesday evenings, but I've heard from people saying, gosh, I would love to be there, but I have to work and it's just too far for me to go. Can you make it for a Saturday morning? So when I get enough people, when I get that critical mass, I'm going to start setting it out saying, hey, who wants to show up for a Saturday morning? And for some people, that will be easier. And I'll bet some people show up for both. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I find thrilling is that I think I'm watching the formation of a band out of some of the people who've been showing up at the jam sessions and who really like playing together and who are hanging out afterward. And it would be exciting to see a musical group form out of that because that's a thing that sometimes happens. And that's a sign that there's real life. That means you're starting a community where it's not just about one day a month to play together or two days a month, that those people might get together and hang out every week and, and be part of a new community. Yeah. That is so delightful. That's really wonderful. I was just thinking um, something that would be neat if you're not doing that yet would be a writer's group. People bring a lot to those, just like they do to music. I'm more familiar with writing, which is why I brought that up. I actually, though, I've, I've been a professional writer since 1986 when I started writing for the old Los Angeles Reader newspaper. And I've had news articles in print and restaurant reviews and other things ever since then. Uh, I have a monthly column in Peninsula Magazine and a weekly column in the Easy Reader. And I have a couple of books out and have written science fiction. And I've never actually been part of a writer's group because some people work really beautifully in a writer's group. But I think I'm one of those people who kind of like goes into a closet and comes out with a manuscript. <laughs> so I know people who for whom it's successful either way. Right. There's, you know, there's a lot that when I've been part of writers groups that I learned that is just indispensable. It's lessons that you would never be able to learn in, you know, years of going to school. And so that's what makes them really effective. But I think the same thing would be true of the jams that you have, you know, Mm -hmm. where musicians are learning how to play something organically. And so it sticks and it's fun and you're getting feedback and good criticism that is helping you become better at whatever that interest is that you've got. If somebody came to me and said that they would like to start a writer's group, I'd be all for it. And we'd get the place open and we do that. So if you want to start a writer's group, I'd be happy to discuss what the mechanics of that are. I'd be happy to start it because absolutely I'd like to support writers. Wonderful. Yeah, we might we might be talking a little bit more after we're done here. <laughs> I think um, that would be great. Um, when I talk about my, my tendency to be 
a solitary creature when writing uh, and not one to completely discuss things before they're done, especially in my fiction, until I've got the first draft of anything, my wife doesn't know what I'm writing. I, I wait to show her anything until I'm pretty sure I have, uh, I'm, I'm confident of that first draft because I want to see what the initial impact is. And luckily I'm married to someone who's a former professional editor. So I have in-house editing and critiquing services. Oh, uh, that's everything. Yeah. When my kids were little, I actually had one hat that was my don't disturb dad, he's writing hat. So that if I was at my computer wearing that, <laughs> the kids knew that, okay, dad's got his writing hat on. So like tiptoe past the room. And, uh, but I, you have to be honest if you're doing something like that, you are not allowed to keep the dad's writing hat on when you're like answering emails or checking something out on the computer. <laughs> it's like, that's just not fair. Right. There's got to be another hat for that. <laughs> I, I think just bareheaded will be fine. You know, I still have the hat somewhere. The kids are long gone out of the house and uh, uh, have learned some of the basic decorum of when they come over and I'm writing. You know, it's, it's interesting growing up in um, a home where somebody writes or somebody is really serious about whatever the craft is. And the kids do learn how to, you know, mom or dad are really busy doing what it is that they do. So they learn to be a little more independent and to provide that space when it's needed. Yeah. I am the kind of person that I don't understand people who don't have something that they love and do uh, in the arts. I don't understand not having some kind of artistic passion in your life because for so many people, that's their reason to live. That's the thing that gives them a sense of worth in the world is their ability to take their experiences and interpret them in some way in an art form. And it may not be an art form that they ever share. I have known people who I have known them for years before discovering that, oh, wait, you know, you're a painter. And it's like, you know, well, you know mm -hmm. just for my own amusement around the house or I draw stuff. Oh, I know a fantastic pen and ink artist who I've been trying to coax to submit some of their work to collage since, you know, the day we got this thing going. Nope, won't do oh, it. No. You know, there are some people who, for whom their personal work is personal. Now I'll mention yeah. that for one thing that I, I want to make sure gets in here fairly early is that people think collage is me. It's not. Uh, first of all, I have a creative partner, George Wojtovich, who actually manages a lot of the art exhibits and has a much better eye for art and hanging art and choosing art than I do. I submit things to him. That's not the decision that I make. And we started Collage together because uh, we actually had met by chance. And he owns the place next door. Uh, it's Showtime at 741 Pacific, which is yes. a kind of an eccentric collection of mostly movie memorabilia and steampunk stuff. And we got to talking at one point and he told me he was having a concert in his basement the next week. And it's like, you have concerts in your basement? I've been running concerts around L.A. for 35 years. And meeting another person that runs shows is like, oh, my gosh, someone who has enough interest and passion behind making things happen. And so I went wow. to his show. I invited him to some of the events that I did. And after a while, collage happened because his life partner, Patty, uh, who is also a partner in collage, although more someone who looks at things from the business side and keeps the wild artistic types on track. <laughs> they had an empty space that they wanted to be something involved with the arts. So I put together a business plan and we said, OK, let's try this thing and see if it works. And unfortunately for us, that was at the very beginning of 2020, right before the pandemic. Uh, so yeah. we had one show come out and that was three days before every venue in LA closed and we had to stay closed for a year and a half. And that's the kind of blow some people did not recover from. Uh, 
lot of fine little venues and house concerts and things around Southern California shut their doors. A lot of fledgling businesses just never made it off the ground. And we were lucky enough to do so. Wow. What a blow to have something like that happen. I mean, it must have been right on the heels of clearly so much work, but the excitement of finally getting something out and then having a door shut right on it. Oh, yeah. That that first event was so much fun. And we were but, you know, we could see it coming by by the day of the event. We could tell that unless something drastic changed, like someone walking up with a cure right now, things were going to be closed. So there was an aura of excitement and a certain order of gloom about, uh, well, here, let's do something great before we get shut down. And what was that show? What was that first show? That show was an artist from North Carolina by the name of Eugene Chadbourne. And a Cali- uh, he plays is best known for his work on banjo or, and guitar, but he plays 15 or 20 different instruments, including some bizarre ones of his own design. Wow. Uh, he strung a garden rake with piano wire just so he could play achy, rakey heart. And that was a joke, but it was hilarious. Uh, <laughs> and he's does all sorts of things where he makes these instruments. Well, he lives in North Carolina now. There's something about the Appalachian tradition of just making your own instruments from a cigar Mm. box banjo or things like that. So if you have Eugene for a show, he's liable to show up with anything. And he has at least 150 albums that he's played on. And then he was along with a bass player by the name of Victor Krummenacher, who was the co-founder of a group called Camper Van Beethoven that had a couple of hits. And oddly enough, for a show that was mostly banjo and stand-up bass, they were playing things like Alice Coltrane jazz tunes. It was like all over the musical map of two veteran virtuoso performers making music together. So it was such a great start, and it was such a shame that, well, that was that for Yeah, that was that for that year. Yeah, I love that whole aspect of the experimental instruments. That's really neat. There's a a song by Tom Waits that I really like, and he's got a lot of those experimental instruments in there. Uh, It's called Chocolate Jesus. The best sounds, the best sounds in that song. So that's always fun for me to watch somebody who's, who's... got a rake with a bunch of guitar strings on it and making it sound good. It it always blows me away. So that's really cool. And that's too bad that that's what happened. Did he ever come back afterwards? No, he hasn't. He only comes to the West Coast occasionally because he's based in North Carolina and he hasn't Mm -hmm. been touring that much since the pandemic started. I need to contact him again about when he could come out here next because he's someone I've known for a long time. Uh, I mean, the the show that we opened up with was a different one. It was the 1st of July of 2021, and it was a soprano by the name of Christina Linhart, who has done a fantastic one-woman show as Marlena Dietrich. And when I contacted her, she said, oh, yeah, my favorite pianist is available, uh, Brian Pizzone. And I thought I might have heard that name before, and I looked him up and thought, This guy has soloed Gershwin at Disney Hall. What is he doing in a 49-seat space in San Pedro? And the answer is anything he likes. Because we don't say only play Gershwin. We don't say only play classical. It's come out here and make music that you love. And we have seduced a lot of excellent artists by not putting limits on them, by saying play the material that is what is near and dear to your heart. And that's what we're about. I like that flexibility and the eclectism that, you know, you can have something that's visual arts one weekend, something that's performance arts, something that, like you said, you've never seen before because it's just not being showcased anywhere else. Well, it does make things an order of magnitude more challenging because of the fact that if you run a jazz club and Jazz is a lot of what we do. It's very popular, and there's no other jazz club really in San Pedro. But if you run a jazz club, somebody knows that on any given night, if they only like jazz and they see that you've got a band, 
you've got what they like. And if you have an eclectic and wide ranging situation, you have less of those people who are musically very siloed or artistically very siloed. So uh, the thing that thrills me is when someone who came in for, uh, well, they came uh, in one particular case, I'm thinking uh, it, it was someone who came in to hear a Native American Tongva woman who was singing new songs in the Tongva language and telling the Tongva creation story alongside an artist who had kind of illustrated it using cut paper techniques. And it was a case of... Mm -hmm. This is someone who came in to hear a Native American storyteller and then who we saw back again for a jazz show and back again for something classical. And it's like, wonderful mm -hmm. people who are culturally omnivorous. I love this. Yeah. You know, those are the people that are really near to my heart. We have a couple of people who show up to just about everything just because they they trust us, I guess, you know, that if it's happening here, it's going to be something we like. Well, and it, there's something exciting about learning, hearing, seeing something new, and you have your tasting programs as well. So, you know, you're you're hitting all five senses and you just never know what's going to be there, but you know, you're going to be delighted and excited and educated in some way. And you might go in not knowing exactly what to expect, but you come out feeling really good about it. But we've hit four of the five senses. I haven't had a touch-oriented event yet. But if I think of one, you know, I'll let you know about that. Yeah, that would be really fun to have something in that regard. Do you have a particular event that was really memorable? Oh, we have had so many. Uh, there have been so many moments that were so exciting where we see musicians marveling at things that just happened on stage. Uh, one of the things that we've enjoyed doing is sometimes when we have musicians who are playing where we have two solo acts who are basically up together or where we have two bands, we ask them, hey, you know, for the finale, would you mind playing together? And in some cases, at the end of the section where the musicians are playing together, they're just looking at each other like, we've got to do this again. That was wonderful. <laughs> uh, and at one point, we did that with a kind of New Orleans-inflected trio called Lafayette, Ben Charlatan, and the Charlatones, and another group called the Good Notes Jazz Band, whose reference was more early 1920s jazz. And when we got them together so that there were nine people on stage playing and singing. It was spectacular. It just sounded like you are not in San Pedro right now. You are in the most happening place in an old New Orleans neighborhood. <laughs> wow. We've had them. We had someone who I never thought I would get to hear live and I got to host, which is a guy by the name of Jim Queskin, who started making albums with the Jim Queskin Jug Band in 1964. And he's now has to be past 90 years old and he's still making music and he can still go through a high energy two and a half hour show. Wow. Uh, that's just, that was magic. And the historical iconic quality of that, you know, I'm sure it just blew everybody away. Yes. And you know, we have some more things coming up that are thrilling and really just the great reward of doing this is to not only experience that myself, but to see the audiences who are having a thrilling evening and realize that I and my crew were able to help bring all of these people together and give them mm -hmm. a terrific evening. And one of the other things that's happening is, uh, which we haven't mentioned yet, is that Collage has a program where we collect musical instruments, refurbish them, and then give them to people who either don't have instruments or are losing them, uh, particularly in the case of high schoolers who graduate. Because when you graduate, you lose the place you've been playing, the people you've been playing with, and the school says, oh, give that borrowed instrument back. Right. And for a lot of people, that's the end of their musical career. And music is a foundation of their life. It's what keeps people sane in some cases. It, their music is their outlet, their creative outlet. And when you take that away from them and sort of cast them adrift in the world, yeah, there are people who 
turn to drugs, turn to suicide, you know, turn to self-destructive things. So anything I can do that will give those musicians a chance to keep playing, we're giving them the instruments, we're giving them a place to play them, and we're trying to foster a musical community. And we're going beyond that. I have contacted a transitional shelter group that helps people who are taken out of abusive relationships. I have contacted a group that works with previously incarcerated people. And bringing those people into a musical community gives them a community that doesn't care where you've been, doesn't care what your background with, what they care is going to play in time and going to take a good solo and then pass it right along. And it's a way of them making friends outside of a back history that could be toxic or unsupportive. So helping students, I've offered this also to a San Pedro group for retired veterans. They didn't get back to me. And I'm thinking, how can you not want to provide music? How how would Mm -hmm. you not want to help them find their music? Because music is how people make connections. But I said, I'm going to contact him again, because we have people who are donating instruments, some of them very good instruments. Yeah, a lot of decent student instruments. We're fixing them up. We're getting them to people. And we're helping them create that lifeline that is so important for so many people. That is amazing musical outreach. And I just love that you were able to zero in on that moment when life can change so quickly. And I don't think anybody ever even thinks about the fact that a musical career often ends when a student graduates. So I I just think that's amazing. I focused in on it because of the fact that I saw this happen in real time, because I credit high school band with keeping one of my kids sane during a period of time in which they were going through some turmoil about who they were. They were in a group of people who were quite unsupportive. Uh, They could have very easily gone in a very bad direction. And in a high school band, they found the group of people with purpose, with a creative function. You know, that kid is now living up in Seattle uh, with someone who they met through that band. The two of them moved up there and they're teaching school, including music, and happy and healthy. And in the same class, there was someone who had been over to my house for jam sessions, because I was holding jam sessions in my living room. There was someone who had been in my house for jam sessions who, a couple years out of school, committed suicide because of the fact Uh that they had lost the reasons that kept them alive. They lived in a home with several other people and You know, if you're a trumpet player who lives with a whole bunch of people, they are not thrilled about you wanting to practice for an hour or two a day. You know, they lived in a place where the music was not part of that experience. They didn't have a car. Their friend group had mostly gone off to other colleges. And, you know, you can't pin it down and say, oh, this is what happened. But everyone I talked to who knew him, his name was Carrie, said, Yeah, music was his form of expression. Music was everything. And you have to wonder if things would have gone the same if Carrie had had the music. So I watched this happen. There's so many ways of expressing yourself, right? And I always think of music as a second language. It's universal, but when you know how to speak it through either singing or playing an instrument... There's something so logical and steady about it and connective. You're you're connecting and expressing what's inside of you through this sound. And so I could see how that would have been isolatory for Carrie and, and I'm really sorry that that happened. Well, I've I have seen this and regarded this as important for a lot of my life. When I was in my early twenties in my first rented house that was over in Lawndale. I discovered that a friend of mine had been writing poetry because this is somebody I had known for a decade and they finally showed me one of their poems. And it's like, this is great. Why haven't you shown it to me? And he said, well, you know, I just didn't feel like I could do that, but I, I guess I know you well enough. I was afraid of the criticism. Mm-hmm. It's like, 
you are a tender soul who would be so bruised by this. And my immediate thought was, you know, no one's going to be brutal in their criticism if they're up next. So I'm going to start holding parties that are going to be whatever you do, come and do it. There are no spectators. It was like the Burning Man attitude (laughs) of there are no spectators. We are all part of this giant art thing. And I just told, sent out to a bunch of my friends and said, if you make your own clothes, wear them. Uh, I'm going to take all of the pictures off of the nails in the house. So you bring your art and hang it. Whatever you do, come and do it. Sing, poems, read, tell jokes, anything. Uh, And we'll look at your art and we'll all do this. And that was something that I did for years. And so it showed the direction in which I was going. That was what I could do with no resources. That's the thing. Anybody can do what I did right there with no resources, but having a house with some walls and having a place where there's room enough for someone who dances to show off their dancing and someone who sings to sing and whatever. It's so inclusionary and innovative and beautiful. You know, it's just speaks volumes that your focus is on showcasing what is important to other people. What is their creative talent? And I bet those were just so much fun. Oh, they were. They were. Well, I am a a mediocre performer. Uh, I have been on stage at various times, including at one point singing and dancing in front of several thousand people at the Anaheim Convention Center. Uh, So Uh I have done that kind of thing. Um, World Science Fiction Convention, there was a performance of a goofy version of Moulin Rouge, and I was playing the part of Zidler, the uh, impresario there, Mm -hmm. which is hilarious given that I turned into an impresario later. But I'm not really an inspired performer. I'm, I'm, I'm an adequate one. But to give people who are excellent performers a place to do what they do, well, you know, that's a skill too. Yeah. And it's the one that I can do that not many people focus on. It's the thing I can bring to the the community of friends and artists. It's a huge gift. I think it's a huge gift to be able to give people that because a lot of times, unfortunately, there was a technical glitch in the uploading of my side of the audio. So from here forward, you're only going to hear Richard carrying on this wonderful conversation. I'll interject now and then just to give some clarity. So enjoy. I think that anyone can find an artistic outlet, even if your artistic outlet is in fostering and helping other artists. It's still a creative outlet. It's still something that gives you a sense of helping to build a better world, a better society. And some of the things I've tried to do at Collage, eh, well, maybe they were a little too ambitious. Uh, It may be that after a period of time of doing this, we do adopt a greater focus rather than the very eclectic style that we have. But I, I have, there's something in my heart that loves bringing the variety, bringing the surprise. So I want to give the people who love jazz at least every month, you know, at least a couple of times a month, we will have the jazz that you love. But I really hope you'll come out and see one of the folk shows too. And because, you know, some of the improvising in bluegrass and some of the improvising in the other music here, there are echoes of the improvising in jazz. And maybe you'll catch on to it in a way that you never did before. And I want to bring some of the people who think they don't like jazz out and have them experience and go, oh, hey, wait a minute, I'm, I'm getting this. And that's just as an example, I, I want to expand audiences because so much of what human beings do in every culture is so interesting. And I'll say it's another thing, and this is only slightly off topic, I think, but we who live in Los Angeles, on the edge of Los Angeles, perhaps, but still in Los Angeles, all around us are these fantastic communities full of people who are creating with references to their own cultural background, their own communities. And most people just never even touch their toe into the sea of creativity that is around them. I know people who have been living in the Harbor area who, when I talk to them about, you know, going for dinner over to Little Cambodia and 
hearing some of the Cambodian music and Cambodian dance, they don't know where little Cambodia is. It's in Long Beach. It is half an hour away from you, maybe. And you haven't been to see this vibrant community that is so different. You haven't been up to Little Ethiopia on Fairfax and walked down two blocks that are like a particularly interesting section of one of the most interesting countries on the African continent. Here is the community full of coffee houses and music, and it's wonderful. And I know people who have never been there, never been to so many other communities. I I am lucky in that my father, when we were growing up, I, I have a twin brother, And my father took my brother and I to a lot of the different communities around greater Los Angeles. Anytime he heard about a food festival or something similar, we'd go there. And so I got to see all of this and got to experience some of the magic of it when I was a kid. And it's still there. One thing that I'll note is that you mentioned the South Bay. One of the things that I've really been fighting is that a lot of people in the South Bay It's not that they think of going to San Pedro for arts and entertainment and then decide against it. It's that they never even consider it. They don't know it's there. Uh, And unfortunately, there is what amounts to a news blackout on the harbor area. Uh, I was talking, I had one phone conversation with Steve Chiotakis, who has the Greater LA program on KCRW. And I asked him to look and find when was the last time they did anything about San Pedro that was not about a backup at the harbor, an exploding oil refinery, or some other tragedy. I said, show me anything that your program has done about the arts in San Pedro. And I talked to a producer for the program later, and they said, yeah, I I guess we're not really covering that much. But I listened to the program because it's an excellent program. But that's called Greater L.A. This is part of L.A. And they, like every other news outlet, mostly ignore the harbor area as anything other than a source of revenue for the city of Los Angeles, a source of pollution. And there is art and music here, but at a certain level, it's going to take some outreach. I wish that people around the South Bay in particular would consider coming to San Pedro, but it's going to take going into the media markets that are perused by the people who are in Manhattan, Hermosa, Redondo. These are people who are affluent. They have the money to travel. A lot of them are sophisticated and enjoy the arts, but they've just never considered the possibility that there's anything here. And we have to reach to where they are in order to get them to consider coming over, in order to get them to think about San Pedro and the harbor in general as an arts space. Because we need to do that. We need to do that for their sake, to introduce them to who those people are. They need to come over and see these people, experience their arts, experience the theater and the restaurants and all of the other things that are here. And when I talk to people who live in Manhattan Beach or Redondo Beach, it's not that they think of coming to San Pedro and then decide against it. It's that they never think of coming to San Pedro. They don't know that there's anything worth coming for. I've heard people who live in Redondo Beach say, oh, well, it's so far to go to San Pedro. And I immediately shoot right back with, do you go up to Hollywood when you want to go to a concert? And they say, yeah. And I said, why don't you look at that on a map and compare that with going to San Pedro? Especially do that and look at what it would be like in traffic. It's going to take you an hour and a half to get up to Hollywood in traffic. And it's going to take you 40 minutes to get to San Pedro if traffic is downright ugly. So why are you thinking that way? And unfortunately, San Pedro has not done a great job of creating a space in the consciousness of Los Angeles as anything other than that's where things get imported into LA and exported from it. And most people don't know what's there. And I think it's unfortunate that this arts community has such a low visibility and hasn't really done things to try to raise consciousness in the beach cities around the Santa Monica Bay It's a thing that everyone in San Pedro, in the arts community and the culinary community and the music community, it's something we all have to work on, is getting that visibility. And it's also about uh, 
insofar as people know about San Pedro, for a lot of people on the Hill, if you grew up in this area and you remember when there still was a Navy base at San Pedro and on every Friday and Saturday night, you would still have drunk Navy men down in some of the bars and you would have various other things happening that were less than savory. Um, I remember what that was like. Uh, my father was a Navy man. Uh, my grandfather was merchant marine. I've never lived within the district, but I've been going to San Pedro since I was a kid because that was where a lot of my father's and grandfather's friends were. So I remember a different San Pedro, but a lot of people, once you've decided, oh, I don't go there because that's a bad neighborhood, it takes some personal experience to get people to look past that. And it's hard to get people to come down for their first experience in the San Pedro downtown, which, yeah, I get it. It's not as beautiful and as wealthy as some other areas, but it has character and it has culture. And I wish more people would come see it. I am regularly trying to promote First Thursday because it's a day on which people see this city about as decked out and lively as it or any other place gets. And I really enjoy First Thursday and I want other people to see it and maybe they'll decide that I should come back. I should come and revisit some of these galleries. I should check out what's happening in music and the arts. It's it's going to take some time to really introduce this community to the rest of LA, but it's something we absolutely need to do. Richard is also part of a fascinating field, that of culinary historian. So here in this next section, I asked him to please expand on that and to provide the proper pronunciation for the word culinary. Enjoy. Well, this is one of those things where depending on whether you grew up in Britain or America and whether you like the Latin or the English spelling, if somebody wants to say culinary or culinary, I don't care, as long as they know what the word means. Now, culinary historians, this is one of those terms, though. A lot of people have never heard those two words together. But I want to make the point that we're not only culinary historians in studying the history of food, we're culinary anthropologists because we are studying the living cultures and we're studying the way that the things you eat make you the people that you are. And that is very, very true in the sense that looking through history, one of the pivotal things in any culture is food security. There are so many examples of cultures like the ancient Maya. Periodically, their cities would fall, their great city-states would fall, probably because of the fact that they worked out all of the productivity of the land around them. And since they were a people who did not have or use the wheel, they did not have carts, they did not have draft animals, they couldn't bring in food from very far away. So food security is what makes your culture thrive. And knowing how to use everything in your environment and learning the ways that people traditionally took everything in their environment and made it not only edible, but delicious is fascinating. And learning all of the ritual elements of food. Uh, the Culinary Historians of Southern California has been meeting for over 25 years. And we've had people who come in and give programs about sometimes it'll be an ingredient. I mean, one of our most popular ones has been on chocolate and just on the history of chocolate. We've had history of vanilla. We've had bread scholars. So sometimes it'll be about a food. Sometimes it'll be about a culture. And sometimes that can be the things you don't know about a culture that you think you do, where we're going into a regional Italian culture or traditional Jewish cooking. And sometimes it's something arcane. Uh, our president loves to give talks about trekking through Uzbekistan, trying different types of yogurt and strange things. And you know, he's someone who has done all that kind of thing, lived to tell the tale, recreated ancient recipes, and it's delightful to talk to a sort of an Indiana Jones of food who goes everywhere and tries everything. So yes, I started out as a food writer and got more and more involved in the anthropology and the history of food because you can't be a good food writer if you don't understand that history. Because if you don't understand the history of a cuisine, you're liable to think something is a brand new idea when it's something that's been around for a thousand years. 
you've got to know, in order to appreciate innovation, you have to know where it starts. And once you start studying that kind of thing, watch out, it can turn into a lifetime pursuit. And in my case, it did. Uh, and I have two books out, one on the history of rum uh, and one on the history of food in flight from the hot air balloon and Zeppelin era to the space station. So it's about everything eaten off the surface of the earth and about the history, the technical challenges, uh, and yes, the anthropology of food in flight, because the fact that when airlines like Air India, one of the first airlines to serve non-European cuisine in the air, it must have been a point of pride for people in India when their airlines started serving their food because previously, even flights within India were serving food designed for English people because that's who was mainly flying, the English colonial masters. So food is a point of pride. It is a point of cultural connection, and it's thrilling to study. I have a website at richardfoss.com, and there are some of my writings about food over time that are there, and people who are curious can go over there and check it out. Since there are so many things that are basically, if not lost recipes, they're recipes that have become unjustly obscure, there are some things that you start recreating some grandmother's recipe or something that you've read about in a book and you discover that this is fascinating. Why are we not eating this on a regular basis? I started uh, trying uh, for a dinner that I did with a friend where we did an eight-course ancient Roman banquet. I started having some of the uh, a type of Roman way of cooking leeks that is from one of the great culinary masterpieces of all time, a cookbook called De Re Coconaria. And we started making this type of melted leeks with basil seeds and garlic, and it was just terrific. And I serve that at regular meals and people think it's you know, a brilliant idea. And it's like, all right, that's 2000 years old. That's not my idea. That's somebody's idea that from long ago, but you've never tried it before. And isn't it delicious? And, and there's another aspect to it also, which is if you learn not only the food, but the food culture of, for instance, uh, a family in India, uh, and if you learn the food and the food culture, if you are so lucky as to be invited to an Indian person's home and you know how to eat like a civilized person, you know how to show that you understand the rules of their culture, they will respect you in a way that they would not if you came in and were eating their food like an American or were judgmental like an American. So for Americans who travel, especially if somebody travels for business, oh my gosh, you should always learn the culture of not only the place that you're going, but of any of your people who you might meet for a business dinner, you should learn who those customers are and learn how to respect their culinary culture because they will remember that of all the people that they met, you're the one who dined like a civilized person. And it also can avoid awkward situations. I remember when I was in my 20s and I was picking up a friend who lived in San Pedro, who was a Croatian from the Dalmatian community. And he had told me, like, just don't even come to the door, just show up at the right time and, you know, I'll come out. And I was thinking, I wonder why, you know, is it something that he doesn't want me to see if I show up at the door? And I showed up a little early, so I knocked on the door and his family was still at dinner. And I didn't realize that the fact that a stranger was at the door meant, first of all, all the women at the table stood and wanted to go get me food because you can't walk into their house without being served. And they didn't want to stop trying to feed me until I sat down and ate something because that would have been barbaric for a guest to leave without having a single bite of food. And I realized finally that yeah, the reason that he didn't want me to just show up and come to the door was so we could get out of there quickly. We were going to be late for the show because I had to go through the whole darn ritual. And it was something that uh, I went back and was at the family home for dinner again. And it was uh, lovely food and wonderful people. But it was just that's that's the ritual of dinner at their house. And if you know these things, you're prepared for it. 
Unfortunately, Richard was running short on time. As I mentioned at the beginning, he was preparing for a program that evening. So in this next section, he gives some information about the website, a little bit more about himself, and how you can get involved with collage and really make it that community venue that you want to see. Well, the first thing to do is to look at our website and look at both the present and past events section and get a little sense of what kind of things are happening and have happened there. And then there is a link there with my email address, richard at collageartculture.org. And I love hearing from people with ideas. Look, it's much easier for me to give the community what they want if the community tells me what that is. So whether it's you saying, um, you know, I play the hurdy-gurdy and would like to come in and do that. Or if it's you saying, well, I know somebody else who plays an interesting musical instrument or has a wonderful little harmony group. I want to get more people in there and I want to hear more people's ideas. So I try to answer as quickly as possible. I don't always succeed, but I try to answer as quickly as possible and I answer everything. And I love hearing from people with their ideas. If there's something that someone wants to teach that is in any way related to art and culture, love to talk to you. <laughs> Richard is a marvelous human being. He's so invested in the arts district of San Pedro and its future, but most of all, the artists and the creatives themselves. I hope that this episode inspires you to visit Collage for one of its many eclectic and exciting programs, and also to stop into San Pedro's monthly First Thursday event, which takes place in downtown, to get a taste of its vibrant arts and food community. And speaking of food, take some time to learn about the rich history of food and culinary culture. You will be fascinated. Collage is located at 731 South Pacific Street in San Pedro. Please consider donating a musical instrument to their wonderful instrument program in memory of Carrie and those to whom music is a lifeline. Also, be sure to check out the show notes for selected links and keep sending me your questions and comments. And if you or anyone you know deserves to be spotlighted on one of the Queen Trail podcast episodes, please send that information in as well. Also, please take a moment to rate this episode because your ratings really do help move this podcast closer to the top of searches so that my friends and I can enjoy people. I'm looking forward to sharing more upcoming in the company of friends talk to you. So be sure to follow me on the socials and the dot com all at the Queen Trail Podcast. That's T H E Q U A I N T R E Double L Podcast. I am still in the Queen Trail, and until next time, I wish you passion, adventure, creativity, music, good food, elegance, and beauty.